Hi, I'm Christina Gagne, and I will make you today a presentation on machine learning. So what, why machine learning? So what is exactly machine learning? Machine learning, we want to uh, develop methods in computers that are uh, uh, useful for optimizing. The point is to optimize a, a model. So we have an information processing model. This model uh, is not specified for a task. It is a general model that we want to optimize in order to be able to process data. And, and that processing of data should be optimized in order to achieve good, good results on, on some performance criteria according to the observations. For example, the training data set, but can be another type of observations we have. So this can be examples, this can be past experiences. So uh, the point with machine learning is that we, we uh, is that we don't know exactly what model we should use, but we have something to support optimizing, learning a model to to do the task. Because if we have the model, there's no need for learning. So machine learning is uh, mostly useful when we don't have uh, specific expertise for doing a given task. For example, when we send a robot uh, on Mars. Uh, we don't know exactly uh, the environment precisely in a way that we know how it will behave, and we are, don't have access to uh, that exact environment to make experiments. You know, when we send a robot, it is super expensive, and we expect that the first robot we are sitting there uh, will work well. Of course, we have many robots, many rovers that have been sent so far, but the point is that we cannot make experiments, we cannot uh, develop a, me a method that is uh, totally trustable from here. We may need, for example, some machine learning for such situation, even though real robots on Mars are not necessarily based on machine learning, but they are based on, on some principles to make it able to evolve in an unknown environment. Uh, sometimes also we have some expertise that uh, cannot be explained because it's implicit. For example, face recognition, it is a really nice example of that. We know we are really good at recognizing faces. Uh, in fact, baby, uh, newborn babies are really good to recognize uh, the face of their mother, of their father, uh, and many things come after that. Many important people are recognized well. Even though a newborn baby is really limited in terms of, of cognitive capacities. And so in, even as an adult, we are really good at recognizing faces, but we are much less good at explaining why this is that person. Because uh, it's something that is not conscious, that is not easy to explain. So uh, if we have to label faces, we would be really good at labeling it. If we have to explain to the computer how to recognize that specific face, this is another story. Another case is when we have access to problems which are changing over time. So if we are in a dynamic environment where conditions uh, are changing, uh, uh, we may not be able to specify everything beforehand. So machine learning then can be useful to adapt automatically the system to the working conditions, the current conditions. Or if we have some solutions that need to be personalized, for example, by in biometrics, if we want to control access to some devices, to some environment based on fingerprints or on faces, uh, we don't know in advance who will get access. We need to be able to add new uh, grant accesses to new persons. Uh, and that can be done with machine learning. In fact, giving some example of that person, we are able to extract the features that will allow them to uh, grant or not access to that person. This can be done with machine learning. So this is examples of contexts where machine learning can be useful, where we don't have everything well-defined at first. We don't have the expertise for doing a task, defining a task for a computer. An example, uh, let, let's assume we have a, a created business that should estimate automatically uh, the risk factor for credit uh, from customers that are applying for getting some, some credits in that place. Uh, and so let's simplify the problem by using two measurements. 
the client's income, which is the first variable x1, and the client's savings, which is variable x2. And, and then uh, we have a database of historical data with many clients that have been classified in two categories. We have the high-risk clients, clients and the low-risk clients which are red and green depending on, on, on their category. So for each of these historical clients, we have their income and savings at first, and we know the outcome on whether or not these clients were able to pay back the credit or not, or what were more, I would say, in trouble in terms of, of, of reimbursing their credit. Let's assume that the data we have look like looks uh, like this, so we have uh, the green stars, which are example of low risk clients and the, 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 the red circles, which are examples of uh, high risk clients that has difficulty to reimburse their credit. And, and this is based on incomes and savings with some scales that is not defined here. And so looking at this, we can see that it's relatively easy to get a rule to process that, to make some kind of decisions. Let's make a rule where we say, if the incomes is higher than 0.32 and the savings are over 0.27, we can assume that it is in the, in the top right zone here. So we have clients that are here and these are historically uh, low risk clients. So this is, uh, when we are on that side, this, this, these are low risk clients. And otherwise, all the other clients in that zone are high risk clients. So uh, the, the point so the, the point with machine learning is to, to infer a general treatment model from specific observations. So we want the model to be general, to generalize. So we want it to be good uh, to to, to, to provide a good and useful approximation of the observations. And the observations are relatively specific. They are like specific cases, and we want to get the general rule from that. Uh, and so we can think that in many cases, the observations are available in sufficient quantities, and they are not expensive to obtain. So maybe by design or the way things are done, we can get many samples, many observations, and, and, and this is often cheap, while getting the knowledge, which often assumed to get experts, get maybe people working hard to figure out what's going on, this can be quite expensive and much more rare. Uh, for example, if we look at how can we link customers, uh, consumers' tra transactions to their respective consumption behavior, uh, think about this for recommendation systems like what is used in Amazon for recommending books, music, any other items based on our history of buying there uh, and the history of all the other clients. So if we see that clients who are buying this and that tends to buy this other item and you, you, be, you buy the two first, so possibly the, the, the third one may be interesting for you. So Amazon, the recommender system of Amazon will propose you, will expose you to this item, hoping that there are chances that you will buy it. Likewise for Netflix, Netflix is relying on recommender systems quite heavily. So according to your viewing history and the viewing history of all other clients, according to what you like or dislike, uh, it will make suggestion of more movies and the point is to keep you uh, as a client of Netflix over the time, they don't want you to stop your, your registration with them. So being able to propose nice movies that you will like and feed you with more and more is, uh, I would say, one thing that Netflix is doing to keep uh, retention, to, uh, to, 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 to keep having their clients be being uh, registered. So uh, perspective on machine learning is to see that, in fact, we are optimizing a model based on the observations with respect to a performance criteria. Uh, so from a statistics perspective, uh, this is basically inference from samples. This is super classical thing that uh, statisticians are, are used to think and, and use and, uh, and, and, and think about. 
from computer science, uh, what we care specifically is also to implement algorithms that are, uh, and also representations that are structures that are efficient, that are uh, uh, good for building and evaluating models. So we want to develop some uh, computer structure, software structure that are good at making machine learning, that are efficient in terms of computation and with a good algorithmic complexity. And from an engineering perspective, uh, we want to solve problems without having to manually specify or specialize the model. So in terms of using machine learning, applied machine learning, the good thing with that is that we don't uh, want to, we want to avoid uh, specifying a lot of things that is coming from the problem. In fact, with enough data, we should be able to learn something while using relatively general algorithms, of course, some, some manipulation of the data, some work on representing well the data for that problem is required. But uh, the, the, the whole point is that with machine learning, we can learn very efficient models from the data without having to explicitly specify or specialize the model that is dealing with that data. There is a different type of different task in machine learning. One is to learn associations. This is not something we will look that much carefully in that course. This is not the topic of our course, but still it is quite relevant. Uh, for example, if we want to make an analysis of a grocery cart, we can say, okay, yeah, we are looking at what people are buying in general, and let's look at the probability that when something, some client is buying product X and also uh, product Y. Uh, so what is the probability of buying product Y once we bought product X? So this is kind of conditional probability. What is the probability of Y given X? So for example, if you look at the probability that uh, someone who is buying beer uh, will also buy chips. So we can see that there is an association and what we saw from historical data is that 70% of the time, 0.7 probability, uh, someone who is uh, buying beer will also buy chips coming from some kind of database. In supervised learning, which is, I would say, the most common mature approach for machine learning, even though there are many others that are super interesting, this is the main topic of the course, supervised learning. So our course is not solely, but mostly on supervised learning. The point with supervised learning is that we want to learn a projection between the input observation X and their associated Y output values. So we have some inputs X, and we know that this X, this input is associated to that output. So we already have the target, the label somehow, or the, the, the value associated as output for that input. And we want to learn how to map these two. So the mathematical modeling of supervised learning is basically to say, okay, we have a function H, which is a relatively general function. We say, okay, H is, is, is kind of the general model we are using. We are basing on some kind of algorithm, some kind of data structure. And then we say, okay, with some given X, we should get a Y that are associated. And our model is in fact parameterized by the theta. So the theta is really the specific parameters that are, I would say, uh, uh, learn through the training of our supervised learning model. So it looks like this. So we have observations, we have, uh, so these are the X, so X1, X2, up to Xn. We have uh, what we call a teacher, in fact, it's not a real teacher, it's a, a way to, to provide the ground truth label, the real label. So let's say that for every X, we have an R. The R, 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 I is the ground truth label or ground truth target of input Xi. And then we are learning uh, the function H X I, X I here. So this function is learned by comparing 
uh, what it gives as output at one time for a given x and the associated label. So we are computing the difference here. That difference gives us the error, and that error is somehow a signal that we are using to improve or adjust the supervised learning system. So that supervised system is uh, the, 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 the learning model, the function h. And we are, don't have the theta here, but basically we are adjusting the theta of our function h as uh, the good as different parameters to hopefully improve performance according to the, the criteria we are, we are using. One specific case of supervised learning is classification. So let's say that we have y, which is a discrete and which is discrete. So basically that's what's specific to classification uh, and correspond to class labels. Usually it's, we are using labels here. And h is then a discriminating function. So h tends to provide the what it thinks as label for a given x. And, uh, and that's it. So the decision is, is basically among the set of classes that we defined before here. So in the example of high low credits uh, risk clients, this is an example of classification with two classes, the high risk clients and the low risk clients. There are many applications of classification. We can think of shape recognition in general, uh, or pattern recognition, in fact. Uh, let's say that uh, we have uh, try to recognize objects in a given image. Uh, so, so we'll, for example, we, we have images of different type of objects. We say we can see dogs, cars, planes, uh, chairs, whatever. So these kind of objects we assume are among the, the set of labels, of class labels that we care. Then we want to be able to identify what is the object in that image of interest. This is a really classical case of objects recognition. We also have unwritten characters recognition. So this is really similar at the difference that we are not seeing real natural scenes. We are more looking at uh, writings on, on paper or on some kind of devices. And we want to recognize, for example, the numbers from zero to nine or basically the, the letters, uh, the words, but be able to, to numerate, to digitalize text, which are can write on paper, scan, and convert that to, uh, I would say, ASCII text, for example. Um, another example of classification is speech recognition, uh, where we want to be able to recognize words that are, that are said on the phone or some kind of devices. Uh, here, the difference is that uh, speech is a temporal signal. We are kind of variation of intensity over time. So there are different techniques to deal with that. It, it boils down to a classification uh, application, but still there are some specific elements from speech that is not covered in that course here. In general, NLP, what we call NLP, natural language processing, can rely on different uh, different tasks of that are classification task. Medical diagnostic assistance is also a nice case where we want to assist, provide some suggestions to help specialists about what's going on, what is that thing, maybe them of analyzing tests, analyzing uh, images that we've got from medical devices. Drugs discovery can also be based on some kind of classification, biometrics in terms of recognizing fingerprints, faces, whatever. These are also, uh, can also rely on classification. So one classical case of, of uh, object recognition is the, the, the image net challenge, which was in fact a very important milestone in machine learning. This is where really deep neural networks were able to demonstrate their capacity in, able to, uh, in order to identify uh, the right class among 1,000 different classes from natural images on a really big data set. So it was a competition to evaluate the capacity for object recognition and, and deep neural networks appears. 
appeared to be super good at this and it was really uh, one of the first uh, extraordinary results obtained with these techniques in 2012, basically. Also for uh, characters recognition, like recognizing numbers from zero to nine, there's a, a very classical uh, problem of doing this with, and there are some benchmark that I said called MNIST and there are several others, but MNIST is quite well known. It is now super easy. I would say that it's not a big challenge. We are able to get 99.3.5% accuracy with this uh, type of data, uh, but still it is a really good example. So here we have 10 classes. So the point is to say we have a number, a single number, and we want to identify this as one of these 10 numbers between, between, between 0, 1, up to 9. Another example of supervised learning, a class, I would say a, a very important problem is the problem of regression. The difference with, with classification is that the, the, the target, the Y target is not a label among set of predefined classes. It is a real value. So we are not working in a discrete domain. We are working on a real valued domain. And then function H is a regression function. So this is called differently, but the behavior, the modeling in general is, is quite the same than with classification. So for example, if we want to make a prediction of the sale prices of used car based on their real age, of course, this is not super precise because uh, having uh, Toyota Yaris versus uh, uh, Porsche 911, uh, it's not the same uh, with the same millage. They are not the same kind of car. So we could expect to get a kind of lot of variation, but still we can think that there are some kind of relation between their millage and the, the selling price. So uh, we can do regression and there's an example here of regression on that. And uh, you see that here, the observation, the input is the millage travel, and the prediction is the sale price. Uh, there are different domains where values prediction can be done, final finance insurance for uh, predicting weather, for example, offering demand in markets, all these things. These are examples where regression is, uh, is useful. In general, so everything that is related to risk and uncertainty, which can be made true, for example, making probabilistic predictions, uh, can be done with regression in some ways. Another different family, so going apart from the supervised learning, what we have, what we call the unsupervised learning. The difference here is that we don't have target output values, we just have inputs and we want to uh, discover the regularities in the observations. So we want to find elements, organize the input data in some ways according to some criterion. For example, if we are looking for clustering, clustering is one of the most known approach for unsupervised learning. The point is to discover clusters of similar observations. So we are able to define that this subset of observations are related are for the same kind of thing according to some measurement. Uh, so there are many applications of unsupervised learning. For example, if we have a big database of users that are purchasing different items, you know, I would say the store or whatever, uh, we can think of doing some unsupervised learning to segment these users, try to identify some profiles, which may not be labeled at first, but we try to say, okay, I have this set of clients are looking alike, they are having the same kind of buying, habit, buying habits. So even we can even suggest them or guide them or see what is the, the trend for these users to provide them with, uh, I would say, better uh, input, suggestions, whatever. In bioinformatics, also discovering patterns in DNA is something that is often unsupervised if we don't have clear signal on, on what we are looking for. Maybe we want to discover some new genes or some effect of a gene on given pathologies or given situations. 
So there are many applications of unsupervised learning in bioinformatics. Uh, image segmentation, when we're talking about computer vision or imaging, medical imaging, uh, we can we are often looking to uh, define coherent regions of images. So we want to be able to, be able to segment, to identify part of the images that are coherent, that are background, that are like a tree uh, versus a person in front of the tree, which is segmented differently. So for example, with autonomous vehicles, segmentation is kind of important to be able to identify the different elements of the image and be able to make decisions based on, on this uh, segmentation, identification of relevant elements. So with unsupervised learning, uh, the flow is looking like this. We have a set of observations, a database with XI. We don't have associated labels. What we are looking is that uh, we can use some matching measures. So, so this matching measure is based on, on what we have as prediction or possibly a grouping. So we could say H is providing us the clusters. And we are looking at how are these clusters scoring run according to our measurement and compute some kind of error on this matching and see, okay, is it good or bad? Uh, and according to that error, we will feed, we will guide the unsupervised, non-supervised system uh, to, to, to learn something better in terms of performance. Uh, one last big problem in, in, in machine learning that uh, we are presenting today is uh, what we call reinforcement learning. So we, reinforcement learning is quite different from the others in the sense that we are more in a case of having agents, having entities that are evolving in environment and dynamically we are looking to learn a policy, a, a way to control the agent, the NTP, a robot, for example, uh, uh, software game uh, AI. Uh, and, and the point is to say, okay, how, how can we learn to play well? How can we learn to, to move or make actions for the, the entities that are good in terms of the tasks for which we can get some reward. The point is that learning is not strictly supervised. We get some kind of signal, some kind of reward, but it is often with a delay. And, and when we get the feedback, it is not necessarily when we did the right action. If there are some actions that are really important, that are making a big difference according to the outcome, it may take, it may take some time before getting the uh, this signal about how good was or how bad it was in terms of doing the task. And so uh, we have a problem of what we call credit assignment. So the problem of credit assignment is like which sequence of action has led to a reward? Is it that sequence or this sequence? Is it that decision in the sequence that was really important? And the other decisions are not that important. That's the kind of things that we, we need to handle with reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, we have many applications in games uh, with one or many players. We can think also about robotic when we need to navigate uh, in an environment, decision-making with agents. So it looks like this. We have uh, an agent that is the intelligent agent that based on reinforcement learning, it makes action. So one action is acting on the environment. And from that action, you can get a reward, it can be immediate or kind of reward about many things that has uh, that, that happened before. And we also get an update on the state. So we get from the current state ST to the next state ST plus one. So for doing machine learning, it is now quite well established domain. We, we, we have many data because you know, in machine learning, everything goes well as far as we have the data to support it. So if we don't have data, we cannot really be serious about doing machine learning in a given case. For testing algorithms method, there are many public data sets. Several of them are toy data sets in the sense that they are small and easy. 
several others are now much more complicated, big complex data sets that are available. So UCI machine learning repository is an old thing, well recognized in terms of providing many data sets, many of them which are super easy to some others that are, I would say, less easy. So uh, this one is a classic. We have Kaggle, which is a kind of uh, site that is promoting challenges in machine learning, you know, to demonstrate your skill, to be able to solve real problem. And with these challenges, are, there are also databases that are made available publicly for doing the challenge. And even if the challenge is closed in the sense that we are with the delays, the organizers are not into this right now. It's something that is like one year, two years, old, we still have access often to the databases that were provided for the challenges. Another example is ImageNet. ImageNet is the really important data set that was proposed for object recognition that was discussed just before. This is a 1.2 million images data set that was a really important proposal. Uh, COCO, COCO data set, common objects in context, was an initiative mostly from Microsoft to provide some more complex images uh, data sets with many kind of annotations for different tasks that is kind of rich, that is kind of useful. It is, so it's a, a nice one. Uh, and there are many open data like the ones provided by the governments. So basically many governments has, uh, have open data policies where they want to give a lot of data about their activities as far as there are no issues in terms of confidentiality and protecting the, the citizens and the country. So think about the US, in Europe, in Canada, even Quebec, we, don't, we have these different sites which provide us with uh, uh, rich data. 